Good evening from Agora Studio in the European Parliament in Brussels. I'm Borian Jovanovski. And I'm Ivana Dragicevic. Why did Serbian Prime Minister Aleksandar Vucic decided to call snap elections in the peak of power despite the country's next election not being due to 2018? Some say it is to simply reaffirm his semi-authoritarian rule of the country. Others say he's trying to strengthen his mandate and get the strong backing of the society for Serbia's EU membership. A biggest expectation from Vucic is to resolve the Kosovo issue. But some ask, are the democratic values, rule of law and media freedoms going to be the victims along the way? And how will European Union position itself towards Belgrade? In the case of Serbia, talk about manipulation of democracy and how the broader geopolitical challenges from refugee crisis to EU's relations to Russia and influence relationships of Brussels and Belgrade. Uh, today with us on this issue, David McAllister, Rapporteur of EU uh, Parliament, uh, European Parliament for Serbia from EPP, Madame Tanya Fajan, Member of European Parliament from Group of the Progressive Alliance and Socialists and Democrats, and Mr. Marko Knežević from University of Graz. Uh, let's start. Some say a negotiation for membership in EU brings democracy and better life. But in the case of Serbia, uh, many also say that negotiation brings uh, authoritarian tendencies. What, what, what do you say? Let's start with Mr. McAllister. Well, to become a member of the European Union means to go through a long process with 35 chapters which have to be opened and closed and a country which wants to join the European Union has to match all the conditions the EU has set. We are a community of values and the first two chapters with Serbia have now been opened and I believe this is beneficial not only for the European Union but also for Serbia because of course um, accession negotiations are a tool to foster the rule of law, democracy and other European values in this country and Serbia is taking a benefit of this chance. We've mentioned geopolitical, let's say, challenges around us, around our broader region and uh, the, the state of things in our countries, especially in the state of democracy and democratic values in countries' candidates as Serbia and Macedonia. Ms. Fayon, uh, you were uh, dealing with media freedoms, for example, for a long time. We, we hear now, we saw the protests on the streets of Serbia. So how do you assess uh, these situations? And is EU maybe not saying enough about the democratic process in Serbia concerning you know, the other broader picture and bigger things around us? I think uh, we are in the European Parliament saying a lot. We have been recently discussing the report on Serbia together with David and the other colleagues. I think we send a strong message to Serbia that is a key player in the region. That is um, for sure one of the key issues Serbia has to deal with freedom of media. The information we receive, what we are seeing on the ground, is something that is um, very concerning. Um, Often we hear about the intimidation, the violence, the um, bad conditions for the journalists, political or economic pressure on the media. And that is something that the authorities, of course, have to assure when we talk about the democratic process in the country and the rule of law, of course. That is why it's important that we are going through the process of negotiations for Serbia. This is not something that is a homework Serbia has to do for Brussels, but the opposite. I think this is something that the citizens on the ground will have benefits. Uh, I can just mention the Slovenia experience. We were six years and longer in heavy negotiations in the process of political and economic reforms. And of course, we reach certain values and standards in which we are protecting fundamental values and norms of European Union. Uh, and that is democracy yeah. and freedom of media. Let's go back to the actuality, the election in Serbia. Which Why? Say, yeah. which, which is, uh, say that, uh, says that he needs negotiation in order to reinforce his position, in order to, make, to have a better position during the process of negotiation with EU and to be more efficient. Uh, what do you think, what's at stake for this? snap election in Serbia? 
Uh, well, not much is at stake uh, because basically, as you correctly pointed, Vucic and his government currently enjoy massive population among Serbian citizens. Uh, and probably the only outcome which is positive and definite about these elections is uh, that he will be re-elected to lead the country in the next four years. Therefore, the question is why call the elections at this moment? And basically, there are several highly plausible theories about it. Uh, one would be that it's easier to cash in now a few more years in power, while the reforms that Serbia has to undertake within the process of negotiations for the membership are not so difficultly portrayed on Serbian citizens. Um, I would just mention a few uh, that would be aligning with um, EU's foreign policy, uh, that would be a normalization of relations with Kosovo and possibly even recognition of Kosovo in the future. So basically this would be a good term to secure another four years in the office for Vucic and his government. Uh, but also there are some other explanations. Basically, uh, we see that current government is a uh, one-man show embodied in Pr Prime Minister Vucic. And um, this, of course, plays good for the campaign, but it plays bad for governing the country. And we see this clearly, specifically on the level of uh, a municipal uh, uh, level in Serbia and lower levels of government where the cadres are often incompetent or at least not as popular as Prime Minister Vucic. So basically, uh, some say that this election is also used in order to strengthen the chances of a ruling party in local elections that are held complementary to parliamentarian elections and also in the elections of um, autonomous province of Vojvodina, which is more uh, liberal-leaning and it has not thus far been conquered by the Serbian Renew Renewal Party. Uh, next, in a constant campaign, it is easier for government to uh, disguise some of its failures because in the past several years we've heard enormous number of increasingly fantastic promises, uh, to mention only some of them, steel factories Medarevo or um, uh, bus factory in Priboy or uh, the fight against corruption. And government basically did not do much to deliver on many of these promises. And while in constant campaign, um, it's easier simply to disguise uh, such failures. Uh, uh, thirdly, it is important to, to notice that uh, while in a constant campaign, uh, the chances for the opposition co to consolidate after a somewhat unexpected loss in power in 2012 are not as uh, uh, strong. So basically it is easier to play this card against the opposition in a constant campaign and to perpetuate the, the uh, uh, oppositional defeat in this way. Mr. McAllister, you are a rapporteur for Serbia. So what are the biggest challenges uh, that you see in Serbia in this period? And will you be traveling to Belgrade during the election campaign, let's say? Or will you stay out? I'll be traveling to Belgrade on election day. Um, I think um, as a rapporteur, I should be there in the country and have a look at what the results will be like. Um, it was a decision of the Serbian government and the Serbian parliament to hold snap elections. That's something I wouldn't comment on. But what I think is important is that despite the election campaign, the European integration process should continue and whoever wins the election and forms the next government, uh, Serbia should stay on its European track. And I think this year, 2016, will be important for Serbia because I would like to see more chapters being opened, uh, the important chapters concerning the rule of law, human rights and other important values. And I think in general, the, uh, the process in Serbia is closely linked to the EU integration process. It's about strengthening the rule of law, strengthening democracy, fighting corruption and making the public administration more effective. And of course, Serbia still has uh, a lot of economic reforms, uh, reforms uh, ahead of it. But in general, I would say Serbia is not, is doing quite well. And uh, I would like Serbia to continue its pro-European integration, that's for sure. You've mentioned, yes. just to say, you've yes. mentioned corruption. Uh, the, the recent survey of International Republican Institute said 98% of citizens of Serbia feel that corruption is the most serious problem. But also 83% of people in Serbia prefer an economically prosperous country over a democratic system of government. Maybe a question for both of you. Mr. McAllister. Well, the fight against the corruption is very, very important. It's a pity that corruption is still widely spread in the Balkans and uh, we've got to help all those who are so courageous in fighting uh, this disease. And the other thing is... Um, do you reckon Mr. Vucic is this kind of person who will do it? 
Uh, I believe that the government of Alexander Vucic is committed to fighting corruption on all levels, yes. Ms. Fair? Um, you might recall that we are every time emphasizing the need to fight against corruption, not only in Serbia, but the whole region of the Western mm -hmm. Balkan. And uh, specifically in the last report, we put out as well the call to do more for transparency of financing of the political parties, which is especially in today's situation very crucial, together with the freedom of media when we are in the election campaign. Um, it's important that um, even political parties are following the international recommendations and the OSC recommendations and this was something that we as well stressed in the report um, I hope that uh, no matter which government will be elected will continue that because it is crucial that's why we will try to open as well and push for the hardest chapters and coming back to, to the elections when you decide for early elections you better want to either strengthen your position or make a radical change of the policy. So in this, I believe the first will prevail and um, I just hope that it will but be what a very radical change of policy. Uh, normally, I said in the conditions when you decide for an early elections, you need to have a good argument why you are doing that. Either you want to make a radical change or you want just to strengthen your position, which uh, 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 is uh, uh, the Mr. case. Yeah, Mr. McAllister, you, you follow closely the negotiation process of Serbia. Do you think it's, that is necessary for Mr. Vucic to strengthen his position in order to have m m more efficient uh, negotiation process? Well, does it was have... his decision and the government's decision and the Serbian parliament's decision to... We are talking in the framework of the negotiation process. But I do understand that he's asking the Serbian people for a mandate mm -hmm. to continue the EU accession process, and he's also asking the Serbian people to get a mandate for necessary reform. Is there any obstacle from the other political parties for... Well, I mean, the, the, the largest process. opposition at the moment are the far right, who are anti-European uh, and very much pro-Russian. Uh, so um, I do understand that Vucic wants to ask the Serbian people for a mandate to continue his pro-EU orientation. That's fine. Yeah, I just wanted to say now it is not up to us now to, to comment what is going on internally in Serbia. As David, we are not planning to come to visit Serbia ahead of the elections, but afterwards. And I think this is um, the only thing that... We are talking about the right. efficiency of the process of negotiation. Exactly, that we, we stressed as well in the last debate, yeah. if, you, if you listen. This is important that we don't lose this momentum of the negotiations. Always in the time of the elections and the campaign, some time is lost. And we hope that this will not be the case, that we would too much jeopardize the speed of the process. And while the campaign is going in Serbia, the process is not being slowed down because the work is being done on the ground here in Brussels with the negotiation team. And uh, I think we have a good chance of opening new chapters yes. after the elections, perhaps in June. Uh, well, the, 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 the main uh, purpose of the negotiation, and that was a by new methodology, is to make uh, progress uh, in the anti-corruption, judiciary, rule of law, and freedom of the media. Could we make an uh, assessment t till now what negotiation process of Serbia brought in this, these values? To, to, yeah. these values? Right. Is there any concrete results? Well, of course, there are concrete results. They're not always tangible, but mm -hmm. uh, th th there are some results. But uh, what my main concern is that um, usually this process is, is, although the EU does not want to, to say it out loud, it's, it's a very technocratic process. It is run by the technocrats sitting in Brussels and also technocrats sitting in Belgrade. Um, and often it is a tick box exercise. Uh, basically, governments are given the demands that they need to comply with, and they tick the box. They say, OK, this is done. And therefore, what we have now in Serbia is, um, Serbia is, of course, a democratic country. Its constitution is in order, its laws are uh, beautiful. Uh, but the problem is not uh, on that legislative side. The, the, the problem is... The implementation. Uh, the problem is that that's, gov that's, the government is not question. ruling by uh, formal laws, but yeah. rather by informal rules. So the, the constitution and laws are often used simply as a smokescreen for government to continue with its um, clientelistic practices, which is the second aspect of this uh, uh, democratic change in, in, in Serbia right now. So basically, uh, the government, a lot of citizens in Serbia depend on government to give them jobs. 
And uh, the story is that um, while you, as long as you stay silent, that you do not live in a liberal democracy, you will get a job. And basically, a lot of citizens depend on government to, to give them job. Recent study by the uh, Regional Cooperation Council said that 75% of citizens uh, basically in the Western Balkans would prefer to work in the public service rather than pri private sector. And finally, you need, to, you need to disguise these informalities and clientelistic network. And therefore, if you look not only in Serbia, but in a wider uh, region, you see that there are two major, two dominant ideologies. One is national conservative ideology, uh, as can be observed in Macedonia with Gruevski, or even in EU member state in Hungary with Viktor Orban. And the other one is the ideology of Euro-Atlantic integration. Uh, now, this is, uh, for me, pretty much obvious in Montenegro, where you have Milo Djukanovic, who runs the country uh, towards the Euro-Atlantic integration. But basically, again, this is simply used uh, as a small screen uh, to fight the opposition in the, in the meantime. Uh, if Vucic gets a strong four-year mandate, an absolute majority in the parliament, can he maybe go to constitutional changes uh, concerning Kosovo? Hmm. Or is it something that Brussels asks from Serbia? concerning the 35th chapter being opened first. Brussels is not asking for Serbia to recognize Kosovo's uh, independence. We can't do that as long as five member states haven't done it themselves, including such important countries like uh, Spain or Romania. Um, I believe that in the end we will need a legally binding agreement between Belgrade and Pristina, so both countries can exercise their rights. And I think it's also very important that both countries don't block initiatives from the other side to join the European Union. So everyone in Serbia knows that this is what the EU requires from Belgrade, and I believe that the Serbian politicians are working on this issue. I know how delicate this topic is, I know how controversial it is, but um, we have to you know, recognize the situation as it is in Kosovo. And Serbia also said that it will prevail its military ne neutrality. It concerns, of course, NATO membership, but concerning also the new EU policies being made uh, in terms of our common foreign and security policies, uh, how will eventually EU assess this? Uh, I wanted to add first on uh, recognizing Kosovo. Frankly, we learned our lesson in Slovenia when we were dealing with Croatia and Croatia membership to European Union. It's good to resolve the open bilateral issues before becoming a member of the European Union. So it is difficult to imagine that Serbia would enter European Union without resolving but when you say resolving, possible. it's Means going to be also a precedent because there's no case like this in Europe. Calling on Serbia and the other five member states of Union to recognize Kosovo. What will be, I, it is a very politically sensitive issue, crucial is that at the moment a dialogue continues that facilitates the life of the citizens on both sides. Could we, could we expect some progress in the Kosovo uh, file with the stronger Vucic after election, like it's expected? Well, uh, uh, another four years in power would definitely give Vucic's government additional strength to pursue this policy more efficiently and more vigorously. Uh, but I'm, I'm simply not sure whether he would be, uh, uh, first of all, able and secondly, willing to, to pursue this, uh, as I said, more vigorously. And I would also like to comment on the fact that Brussels is not demanding uh, recognition of Kosovo. Yes, this is a fact, uh, specifically while five EU member states do not recognize Kosovo themselves. But uh, as Tanya has mentioned, uh, Croatian uh, accession to the EU has developed a new set of obstacles for new members to join, and these are bilateral. Uh, conditions, as we currently see in uh, Macedonian case as well, by uh, conditions imposed by Greece. And I'm not convinced that, that some of the uh, EU member states would not specifically ask from Serbia to recognize Kosovo be before becoming a member state. And then Brussels' hand would be, would be tied to, to uh, further uh, Serbia's progress towards membership.
So this is my concern. How was Serbia's role in uh, refugee crisis uh, monitored, let's say, in Brussels? We saw the so-called Western Balkans EU summit uh, when the whole, the, the, the how to say, uh, plans for the Western Balkans route would set and now we are witnessing what we are witnessing. So how was Serbia's role viewed in that and uh, concerning the recent closure and the recommendations from the European Council, how do you see cooperation with Mr. Vucic? Yeah. As regards the, the refugee situation, um, Serbia reacted in a positive way, but the whole, con the whole situation on this Balkan refugee part is um, very complex. There is not a single or a simple approach how all the countries of the region were dealing. They were all at some point pushed to start cooperating. From the beginning we saw lack of inf information, people were crossing the green borders, the governments were not cooperating and that led to the extraordinary summit of Western Balkan leaders in Brussels. After that moment I think that the cooperation strengthened and that was important for all the countries on this migration route. And yes, Serbia was often praised as um, reacting well in this situation, but, but we have to recognize that it was only a transit country. Mm. So it's much easier to act in such situation when you know that people will just cross, you have to facilitate them for a few days. Do you count on Belgrade's role in, uh, let's say, uh strengthening or renewing relations of European Union and Russia? Especially maybe in terms of Syrian crisis, because we saw uh, that uh, Russia decided to pull out its army from Syria. We expect finally peace negotiations. Most of the refugees are coming from Syria and being granted the status of refugees in European countries and in Western Balkans. So does European diplomacy works as it once was through its Proxies. <laughs> Serbia traditionally has close ties to Russia, uh, and that's okay. We should respect that, and perhaps these close ties uh, can be uh, useful. Um, on the other hand, Serbia will have to align its foreign policy to 100% standard of the European Union. In a lot of fields, Serbia has already aligned its foreign policy, mm -hmm. but we do have different views on Russia. Um, it's well known that we all found it regrettable that Serbia didn't join the sanctions against Russia after the uh, annexation of the Crimean. And we also consider Serbia holding joint military exercises with Russian forces as uh, regrettable and something we would prefer not to take place. On the other hand, Serbia also has a good cooperation with NATO partners. So, in general, Serbia is aligning its foreign policy, but we do have different views on Russia, but the, the, the government in Belgrade is well aware of that. Mm. I, would, I, would, I would like to go back to the, our dilemma in the very beginning of our program. Uh, do you think that the democratic values in Serbia could be in danger uh, just because European Union or m many of the European uh, members, or members of the European Union would like to see the Kosovo uh, issue resolved well uh, or russians influence under yeah correct okay. uh, well th there is often a, a talk about the trade-off between regional stability and democratization uh, and uh, basically recent recent actions by the eu can sort of back up this uh, theory because uh, in my in my opinion feel free to intervene mm. right of course <laughs> uh, in my opinion uh, uh, and basically this has been recorded, as you say, by IRI and other uh, credible actors. Serbia is backsliding in terms of media freedom, in terms of democracy, for the seventh year in a row now. And uh, uh, despite of that fact, it has opened up its uh, EU accession talks, and uh, the EU seems powerless to prevent it at the moment. Uh, and uh, the reason for that might as well be this trade-off between uh, uh, normalization of relations with Kosovo, uh, a su successful Serbia's role in the, uh, dealing with the refugee crisis, and in a broader sense, this regional stability. Uh, about for them? Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, I just wanted to say that's why we have the negotiation process. It will not happen over the night and the next 
maybe a couple of years. Yeah, but we expect but it to get better, as you said, in the case of Slovenia, as we had in the case of Croatia. Now we are all in the EU and it doesn't matter to have Orbán and Poland. Each next round of the accession mm -hmm. negotiations is more demanding than the previous one. Political union is as well more or less ready to accept new members. So it is a long and demanding process. So I wouldn't say today what can block Serbia on this path that will last maybe another few years. So important is to keep the dynamic, to work with Brussels, to try to be engaged in a dialogue and to keep the commitments. Is there any it's not only to yeah. put everything on the paper and make it nice, which is often the case and then not implement it in the practice. Is there any lesson, lesson learned from Macedonian uh, case? case? Uh, supporting the government in order to resolve the strategic issues like a name issue with Greece and ignoring at the same time the very democratic basic values. Mr. McAllister, yeah, yeah, for the end, because we're out of time. I think what we need in the Western Balkans is stability. Uh, that's why the European Union is committed to all six countries of the Western Balkans being able to join the European Union once they are ready. And I think it is important to strengthen democracy and the rule of law, but also to support those governments which are in favour of regional cooperation and regional reconciliation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Poštovani gledatelji, hvala vam svima. Pratili ste još jednu emisiju Balkan u Evropi iz Europskog parlamenta. Srdečan pozdrav. Pozdrav.